I am water resources supervisor now, but I came on board as a um, senior hydrogeologist and with a background in geology. And this is a, a presentation I've been wanting to give for years. In fact, some of the slides are a few years old, sorry about that. But talking about the geology and the hydrogeology of the region, how that affects what we do, why we can do what we do here. Um, we are in a fantastic climate and a great geologic situation that I think will set the stage for the more immediate history of United that you'll hear next week from Murray. So I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna start my story. I, I, Mauricio mentioned history of the United going back a hundred years. Uh, I'm gonna start four and a half billion years ago like all geologists always do. And I'm gonna go a hundred years into the future. And I have some rocks and some soils in front of you. The rocks are in front of Tony. Tony, when I get to the point where I start showing rocks, I think it's just a couple of slides away. Would you start passing those around? And Pete, there's some, some examples of our local aquifer and our confining unit in front of you. And, and after Tony gets his rocks going, they're, they range up to about 35, 40 million years old. And then after he gets those started, you can show some people what our aquifers and our aquitards or confining units look like. You can start passing those around. <laughs> I knew you were going to throw rocks. And I've got a cookie up here that I'll throw back if you do. Um, always save an oatmeal cookie for myself at the start of every presentation. So real quick, though, I'm going to set the tone by describing the challenges we have and then I'll, I'll briefly introduce the, the presentation. So why is groundwater so important to us in general here in Ventura County? And it's because we're in the dry part of the country. Let's see if I've, eh, that's not the one I want. How do I get this? Do I hold? Well, okay, I'll, I'll just live with what I've got. I was hoping to get to a pointer here. The point is we are west of the 100th meridian in the North American continent, which is generally dry. And this was recognized way back in 1872. The 100th meridian, by the way, is the 100th line of longitude west from, is it Greenwich, England? But um, you'll hear songs about the 100th meridian, meaning the dry part of the country. And uh, it's, it's always been known and important. And we live, of course, way over here off the coast of California. So this map shows the area in gray where you have more than 20 inches of rainfall a year. And that rain usually falls year round. And that's where, at least until about the last century, you could count on being able to grow crops. West of that line, until about 100 years ago, you basically couldn't grow crops. So there's not much history in California of farming um, or Arizona or elsewhere until about 100 years ago. And we'll talk about why in a minute. And then real quick, this is John Wesley Powell's 1890 map, and it gets into a little more detail. I'm not, I'm not gonna emphasize this too much, but it, it has the same boundary of the, the arid lands of the United States. Um, and it excludes Northern California, Western Washington, and Western Oregon. But you can see us, we're part of that arid area. They, he's broken it up into distinct basins. We're in this coastal zone right about here. Uh, there's Santa Cruz Island. But it, the point is it's re been recognized for more than a hundred years that, that we're pretty dry. And why does that make groundwater important to us? Well, I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> Just say we are fortunate to live in Ventura County. And the mountains up above us, Reyes Peak and the Topa Topa Bluffs, they get over 30 inches of rainfall per year. So that's, or 35 even, and that's more than Seattle. We know that doesn't happen every year, but we have some local rainfall available to us, some water. We have a good watershed. And there's a place in the, in the upper part of the Topa Topas that actually gets over 35 inches per year on average, as opposed to what we get here in Oxnard, which is about 14 or 15 inches per year. So we have great soil, but every year we have this four to six month drought that we all know about. We just call it summer and fall here, um, but it is a drought and back east, uh, they, would, they would definitely consider it a killing drought if they had to get through a summer without rainfall, but they get rainfall every year. We don't because of our Mediterranean climate. And like I note here, people and crops, you know, you just can't survive four to six months without water. Our watershed area, 1,600 square miles. The average volume of rainfall that falls in that watershed is 1.6 million acre feet per year. And we capture just a tiny bit of that, but uh, that's about it. You can't see it, but the average flow in the Santa Clara River is about a, is somewhere between 200 and 250,000 acre feet. I think Murray will confirm that or tell me if I'm wrong. And then we divert an average somewhere around 68 to 70,000 acre feet. Over the long run, we haven't been diverting that much recently. 
but we don't divert 70,000 acre feet every year, obviously. This is this year, this is a photo I took below Freeman diversion and we had fantastic flows, right? But a lot of the river, a lot of the time, looks like that classic picture from up around Fillmore and Piru. And so we somehow have to get through these long dry winters. And we do that with groundwater. And for the folks that don't really understand groundwater, new people, and maybe some people that have been around, but have always assumed we have underground rivers like caverns with flowing water and, and whatever, um, salamanders and what that, we don't, we don't. What we have is a little bit of the rainfall, about 10 to 15% of it percolates through the soil. And in, uh, when it meets a barrier at its base, it's like a bathtub, it fills up with water. And basically all of our stored water in our basins is in these little tiny grains between or grains of sand and gravel in it about if you had a cubic foot of this soil and sand that's underneath our feet today about 25 percent of that would be voids between those little grains and those voids get filled up with water over time and so that's we have a huge storage reservoir here i think i took out this slide but basically we probably have more stored water under our feet in the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins and there is in Lake Shasta, so over 4 million acre feet. Now we can't access most of that because it's pretty deep, but there is a lot of water down there. And so we have this potential source, but I've talked about these four to six months drought, four, four to six months droughts. And so we have to connect the two so that we have enough water and we can access that water for survival. So Murray's going to talk a lot more about how we've developed that, but I just want to give some of the background information on how our aquifers came to be, because like I said earlier, it is really important. How our climate has kept them full, for the most part, historically. Why United has been, and the successes we've had in helping Mother Nature along and keeping those basins as full as they can be. And then I'm going to touch on what does the future hold, so that 100 years from now, where will we be? without getting into projects. So I told you I'd start four and a half billion years ago in what we call the Hadean, named after Hades, epoch or era of earth history. And earth back then was just um, a glowing ball with some kind of pre-continents, just a lot of basalt floating in lava. It was really rough. About three and a half billion years ago, we had bacteria. I just want to set the stage for where we are time-wise. Pre-Cambrian, two billion years ago, we started getting colonies of bacteria forming corals or something like corals. They're actually not corals, it's less than coral, but some life. About a billion years ago, we started getting soft-bodied animals. We don't really have hard fossils yet, but the, the first kind of like worms and jellyfish appeared. And then by the Paleozoic, my, covered, my colored zones there, the Paleozoic era, then we start getting into what we all know is, is kind of the history of life on the planet, starting with with trilobites back in the Paleozoic, dinosaurs in the Mesozoic, big mammals, the age of mammals in the Cenozoic era, and ultimately leading to us today. And some people would say, hey, we've entered the Anthropocene epoch, meaning the, the time of man, and it's probably true. And how does this relate locally? I just wanted to mention, we don't have many old rocks in Ventura County. So if you're expecting to take your kids out or if you're gonna be digging out in the um, recharge basins in Satakoy and hope someday you'll stumble across a dinosaur fossil, I, that's it's just not gonna happen. It's, it's not gonna happen. There are some fairly old rocks up on Fraser Mountain in Northern Ventura County. We have the Fraser Mountain Nice, which is about 1.6 or 1.8 billion years old. Pretty old. If you get up there, um, you know, it's kind of cool to think about how old it is. It's not very interesting rock. There's a few, sorry, if anybody likes metamorphic rocks, I didn't mean to offend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a few rocks that are kind of jumbled up from the age of the dinosaurs in Matillahawk Creek. So you might find a broken piece of dinosaur bone up in Matillahawk Creek, but we can't see any rocks from the dinosaurs older from where we stand today. They're just, they're not even visible. So oh, let me go back real quick. So I want to focus on, well, I think it'll be fine if I go forward. No, I'm going to have to go back because my, my photo there is covering this up. So my next slide is going to show another timeline Oops. that just focused on the very end of this whole geologic history of the earth. So I'm just, the next slide, the next timeline is just going to show this last little bit, the Cenozoic for scale. So that's the whole timeline. And um, today, right now, I'm just going to be talking about 
from the Mesozoic era when the dinosaurs got wiped out probably by an asteroid. There's some doubts about that, but generally accepted geologic theory right now is that dinosaur came from when the dinosaurs were wiped out to present. And that's when most of our rocks were formed, including if you look up at the Hopatopa Bluffs, that's the Matillaha sandstone. So about 40, what, 48 million years old. And then the Cespi formation. Oh, this is when Tony can start sending out these rocks. I've got an example of Matillaha sandstone there and Cespi formation. Conejo volcanics, I don't have a picture of, but Murray knows what those are like. He lives in them. And then the Monterey formation, uh, fairly recent. And all of these rocks, these are visible in our area. In fact, if you've seen the Cespi, when you see that, that purple or mauve color, you're going to find that all over. If you drive around, you'll see it um, all the way down to San Diego and up into Santa Clarita. It's really, it stands out. It's very visible and obvious. And if you go to the beach, you're going to see the Monterey formation all over. Now, these rocks, they form kind of the, the boundaries of our aquifers. They don't, they, you can imagine if you look at them, if you dropped water on them, they don't really absorb very much water. They don't hold much water. But what's important about them, besides the fact that they, they kind of, they form the basins that hold our aquifers, is they were folded most recently and during the uh, formation of the San Andreas Fault. Um, and that's relatively recently, within about the last 5 million years, most of the topography we see, the mountains and the basins form then. San Andreas Fault really started kicking loose four or five million years ago. And there's some pressure across the San Andreas Fault that not only make it slide northward, you know, you probably heard, hey, eventually Los Angeles is gonna be next to San Francisco. And yeah, that's probably true in a long, long time. Um, but they're also compressing the rocks, which as you can imagine, you know, layered rocks, if you imagine now you're pressing against both sides, they tend to buckle or fold when you do that. And that forms ridges and valleys. And this is really becoming more important to our, our story of our aquifers. And so you can imagine now you take the same ridges and valleys and as the, the ridges are rising, they're also eroding by rainfall and the sediment, the sand and the gravel and the clay that washes off those mountains, it, they tend to fill the basin. So that's how we get things like South Mountain, that, that big ridge of South Mountain. And then to the north and south of, the, south of it, we have these basins that are filled with sand and gravel that make these great aquifers. And that was a silly cartoon. I want to show now a real geologic cross section. So this is what the area looked like about 4 million years ago. There was a little bit of faulting, but this is before the San Andreas started pushing things around. There was a little bit of faulting and a little bit of folding, but from north up by Big Cry, uh, that's really up by Pine Mountain, to south down near where the ocean is, that was about 99 miles length 4 million years ago. And then that compression has caused it all to crunch up and fold. And so Ventura County now is about 33 miles shorter from north to south than it was 4 million years ago because everything has been crunched up and compressed. And it's not as pretty as I showed in, the, in my simplistic graphic a minute ago. There's faulting and thrusting going on. But the important things here are the Ventura Basin, so that kind of downfolded the rocks right underneath Ventura in Port Wainimi which made it this, this very important basin for both oil and groundwater. And you can see the folds, they get eroded off. So even though the mountains are getting pushed off, it looks pretty flat here. That's because the mountains are eroding almost as fast as they're getting pushed up. Then you get up to Pine Mountain to the north. And I'll just say real quick, cause some of us are curious about oil and gas as well. Oil and gas, they tend to be trapped in these mountains where these you know, the, the layers come up, gas and oil tends to float on water or rise, and they tend to rise up towards those, those anticlines, we call them, those upward folds. So this map, all the purple here, the purple dots show oil wells in our area, and they are focused on the ridges, but even Camarillo Ridge, and, and sometimes out in the basin where we know these anticlines continue off underneath the Oxnard Plain. And so they, again, they tend to form in the ridges. And then the blue dots show our groundwater supply wells, not ours, all the water wells in the, uh, within our service area. And you can see they generally form in the basins because those basins have dropped, they filled with sand and gravel and the water tends to collect there. These other colored units, those are all those bedrock units I talked about, like the red is the Conejo Volcanics and, and these are some of the older rocks surrounding us. Let's see if I can move on here. Might have to get some help.
So now I'm going to take this long 67 million year time scale that I had up a moment ago, which was really just the end of the Earth's geologic history. And let's go back one more time so you can see where I'm going to, uh, I guess it's not going to work. Oh yeah, this is it. So this is that whole period, the whole tertiary period when mammals rose 67 million years ago. And we're just going to focus on the very last two and a half million years now, because this is really important for our aquifers. This is known as the Pleistocene epoch, the ice ages, right? You've probably heard of that. And interestingly, this is when our genus Homo arose or evolved. That was Homo erectus, one of our ancestors. And as I understand it, I'm not an archeologist, but the first, or anthropologist, but that was the first member of our genus, uh, like I said, Homo. And ultimately it led to, <laughs> led to me. Um, <laughs> Anatomically modern humans is now the, the preferred term. It, it is, believe it or not. Anatomically modern humans uh, is the preferred term. Um, and they rose 200. Some people are now pushing it back to 400,000 years ago. And I picked my picture so as not to offend anyone. You know, didn't, could have picked Mauricio's picture. But honestly, th that picture of the anatomically modern human is probably a little pale because our anatomically modern humans all arose from Africa. And the Pleistocene is, like I said, the time of the ice ages. And normally when we think of ice ages, we think of, oh, okay, just this, the last ice age about 20,000 years ago. So this graph shows sea level in the blue line. And the red line across the top is today's sea level. So this red line going straight across right at zero. And I want to point out that the Y axis here is in meters. So where the blue line goes down, that means sea, lo sea level was lower than it is today. And where it rises above the red line, that means the few times when sea level has risen slightly above what it is today. And this is important for the story of our aquifers here. And the sea level drops tend to happen during periods when we had a lot of ice on the continent. That's why sea level dropped, is because so much rainfall or snowfall was being deposited on our continents, North America, Europe, Asia, um, Antarctica, probably a little bit in Africa and South America, that it actually trapped all the water on the continents, meaning that the sea level was, was dropping and, and the oceans were getting saltier because all this fresh water was getting dumped on the continents and stayed there locked up in ice. So we often think of like the Ice Age movie, this very last Ice Age as the Ice Age, but you could see there were a whole lot of dips and they started even before two and a half million years ago, but they really got kicking two million years ago and one million years ago you can see they start increasing in amplitude. It means it got colder each time this dipped and there was more ice on land and it warmed up very quickly between those ice ages uh, into these, these spikes you see. Some of which, like this is called the Eemian here, about 135 years, 135,000 years ago, uh, sea level rose about seven meters or 20 feet above where it is today. Um, so there, the point is there were a lot of ice ages. Ice came, sea levels dropped, there was a lot of erosion, the ice melted, sea level rose, and there was a lot of deposition, usually near the ocean. And so this is some of our aquifers in our area when they formed, and they all formed in this, this Pleistocene to Pliocene era, yeah, this is all Pleistocene epoch. Um, and they don't know the exact dates, but our oldest aquifer is only a couple million years old, you know, about the same time that the first humans um, appeared in Africa. And then the Fox Canyon Aquifer, about 1 million years old. And the Wainimi Aquifer, um, you know, much, much younger, half a million years old. And the Magoo Aquifer, and then we're getting really into modern times or close to modern times. And then the Oxnard Aquifer, the very end, the Holocene epoch, which is when, after the last ice age happened. So the Oxnard Aquifer is our youngest. It's also the uppermost aquifer. One of our best aquifers too, because it's sand that was deposited along a, a mostly a shoreline environment near the beach. And it's still very loose. And if you go out and dig in our, our, our pits, uh, I've done this before at Satico, it's really cool. It looks like beach sand. So water just soaks right in. It's a fantastic setup for recharge. It's really important to us. And then how does this relate to other things we might know about? Well, like I said, we talked about anatomically modern humans. They spread out of Africa about 90,000 years ago. Paleo Indians didn't arrive in California until the very end of, of this many, many ice ages, and especially the, you know, the big four that happened in the last million years, really North America really got populated 
very recently during this last rise. Can everybody see this? It drops, right? You can see the bottom, the ice age 20,000 years ago. And this line is very close to the right axis here, vertical axis, but there's a, there's a line rising here that takes us to today. Um, kind of hard to see. I want to mention that we just spiked, you know, very, very recently geologically, right? right there. The temperature spiked and sea levels rose to where they are today, to modern sea level. And all of civilization happened then. Um, domestication of, of crops, so all farming started then. Domestication of most animals, maybe not the dog, that might have started a little earlier, but all domestication of animals, the rise of city, the wheels, written language, it all happened on this little tiny spike of warm temperatures that we've known for about the last 10,000 years, which I found fascinating, and that's about the same time the Oxnard Aquifer uh, formed. Oh, and you are here. And so I, I talked briefly about, or I, I talked a moment ago, about ice covering the continents during the last ice age. Um, glacial extent, you can see Chicago and Milwaukee and New York and Boston, they were all under ice. And the importance of that to our story is looking here at the Ventura County and Santa Barbara County coastline is when sea levels were 400 feet lower, that meant that land was well offshore. I mean, the, the coastline, the coastline isn't where it is today. Um, there's shallow water going three to seven miles off the coast of Oxnard and Ventura. And so all that was land. And what that means is when our aquifers were forming, they weren't, that formation wasn't ending at the coastline where the coastline is today. It was ending where sea level was 20,000 or whenever the aquifers are formed, depending on which aquifer you're looking at. And the point is our aquifers actually don't end at the present day coastline. They go offshore three to seven miles. And there used to be, and there might still be, especially in Ventura's case, fresh water stored in these big basins um, well offshore. It, where if you go fishing, uh, like I go kayak fishing a mile or so offshore occasionally. And it's, it's just interesting to think that once in a while, you know, like out where I'm fishing, there's fresh water in the ground underneath the ocean seafloor. And I'll just touch Real quickly, one last time on these rising sea levels because they're so important to the formation of the Oxnard Aquifer. And just to put it, a scale on it again, first humans arrived from Siberia here when things started warming up. Uh, a whole lot of Pleistocene megafauna like woolly mammoths and saber-toothed cats and giant sloths and big cave bears. They all went extinct coincidentally soon after those people arrived. There's some debate about how much influence those people had, but. It, I'm not a big believer in coincidence. I think most of them got eaten. Um, the Oxnard Aquifer formed about the same time that the Pleistocene megafauna were going extinct. So you're probably not gonna find any mastodon bones in the Oxnard Aquifer or out in our recharge basins either, unfortunately. And then we had just a couple hundred years ago, more humans arrived from Siberia, Russian fur traders, and soon after um, Spaniards coming up from Mexico. So. Um, yeah, just trying to put things in perspective of where we stand today. And that brings us up to modern sea level and more or less the landscape we know today. It all happened relatively recently when you think in terms of geologic scale. So now I'll talk a little bit about what the aquifers look like and, and less, less history lesson. So if you took a cross section from north to south through our aquifers, we have bedrock, which is that Mostly here, it's Coenejo Volcanics or Monterey Formation uh, immediately below the aquifer. So that's what, what I've got labeled as bedrock down here in the brown. And then we have our three aquifers and they can be pretty thick, up to 1500 feet thick. Um, the Grimes Canyon formed a long time ago, like we said, um, uh, two, million years or so, 2 million years ago or so. And then overlying that is the Fox Canyon Aquifer and the Wainimi Aquifer. And together we call that the lower aquifer system, generally good water quality. And then we have the upper aquifer system, younger aquifers. So they, you know, the, the deposits formed on top of those old deposits. There's a little bit of confining shale shown in this gray with the horizontal bars. Those are confining clays and, and silts between the two. And there's some holes between the two in places, especially over here. We'll figure out why this is important in a minute. So the Oxnard and Magoo aquifer combined make the upper aquifer system. Um, and then this is the clay cap up here. It's actually part of the upper aquifer system, although we, it's not really an aquifer, so I, I don't really think of it that way, but it, it is uh, officially. And finally, we have the semi-perched aquifer. So right below us is the semi-perched aquifer. It's, it's um, not a very good aquifer. It's poor quality. It's about 100 feet thick before we get to the clay cap. And you go to the four bay, just a little bit north of us, this is where the four bay starts, where the clay cap disappears. And all these rocks have been folded upward 
the, the sands and gravels of the Oxnard Magoo Aquifer has been folded upwards and, and the clay eroded away, which makes is why the Four Bay is such a perfect place for recharge. And like I said, sea level when some of these aquifers were forming was quite a bit lower than it is today. And so we get natural recharge in the Four Bay historically that slowly over tens or hundreds of thousands of years filled up the aquifers with water and the water moved towards the ocean. That's because the Four Bay is about 130 feet or a little higher above sea level. So when you fill it with water, it tends to discharge out where there's less hydraulic head, where here the sea level is zero feet. So there's a little bit of hydraulic head. It put, the water just gets pushed through the aquifers over time. We formed back before there was pumping in the basin because groundwater elevations were a little higher here than they are here. And we had a, these clays and uh, especially the confining layer here, the clay cap. Um, the pressure within the aquifer was high enough that it would have made the aquifer rise above sea level. And um, in fact, it did. The very first few wells constructed here were what we call um, artesian, they tapped into artesian conditions or flowing wells. All you had to do was drill into the Oxnard aquifer through the clay cap and the water would just come rising out of the, out of the well, kind of like um, Beverly Hillbillies when he shoots a bullet in the ground and the oil comes out. Just, you didn't have to pump it or anything. Would have been a great time back then. And then ultimately all that water pushed out to the ocean under natural conditions. And I just wanted to mention, but take a, we'll come back to the aquifer in a minute. What's important to think about too, is that we don't get the same amount of rainfall every single year. We've experienced that already, right? It's been rough when, during when you have droughts. So if you look back with tree rings, we look back the past 700 years, we can estimate how much rainfall we had. And on average, now let me go back for a second. I'll just say this black dashed line, this is the 20 year moving average. These blue lines show annual rainfall going back 730 years or so, uh, a little beyond 1300. I start the scale here at 1300. But this is the average and you can see that we go through these periods, the dry periods when the average is relatively low and then peaks where it's high. In other words, we've had 20 years of wet. Um, on average, it's been 17 and a half inches per year at Santa Paula over the last 700 years. And if you look at modern averages, it's about the same, about 17, 17 and a half inches in Santa Paula. So things haven't changed over the long-term average very much, but you can see we, we do get like a 20 year period where the average in, in 1946 to 1965, where it was only 14 inches per year. So we've had, that was a really long and bad drought. Um, probably slightly worse than our, our most recent drought with this last rainfall. I don't think it'll look quite as bad as a 20 year average. And then we've had really wet periods, the 1990s, even leading to 2011, we had over 20 inches. If you look at the 20 year average, 20 inches of rain, it had been more wet on a couple of occasions. We see back in the late 1500s, we had a peak that got even higher, hit that peak here. Probably our worst drought in the last 700 years though was right here, 1946 to 1965. A couple of other reference points for timing. The Black Plague happened in 1348 and we had the Little Ice Age from 1350 to 1850. The Little Ice Age really didn't create a lot of ice. I mean, it wasn't like the whole planet froze up like one of our big ice ages. It was probably just a North American and maybe a European thing. But it is interesting. Uh, there were long periods of relatively stable climate in our area during the Little Ice Age with a couple of really wet periods. So we do have, we've had natural variability in our climate. It's hard to tell if you're looking at annual graphs how much things have changed or how they haven't changed. So I plotted 50 year averages over that period of rainfall in Santa Paula again, just to see how they change. And you can see, if you look at 50 year averages, it generally hangs out right around this 17.3 inches line, uh, the, the, an average of 13 points or 17.3 inches. Now they do drop occasionally. You get a 50 years where it's a couple inches or an inch and a half less rainfall. And then we've had a couple of really wet periods in the 1600s and 1700s where it's gone above. And in fact, you can see, we always think about the droughts of the 20th century, but really the 20th century was pretty wet. And I don't go beyond this line, unfortunately, you can't see the, uh, the end of it, but this is 2000 right here where I'm running the, uh, the cursor up the middle. So we don't have a full 50 years since then, but I imagine we're gonna be within that same old average in the next 50 years, the period from 2000 to 2050. I've also plotted on here, because we're gonna come back to this, um, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, right? We're all concerned about 
about global warming, uh, the effects of CO2, climate change. And you can see that starting around 1850 to, to 1900, this period, we see a slight tick up in CO2 concentrations related to the beginning of the industrial age. And then they slowly kick up over time and they really get into high gear in the second half of the 20th century after World War II. And this, even though we don't have a full 50 years record yet, this is where CO2 concentrations were as of 2020 in the atmosphere. And it's probably gonna be slightly higher if I was able to do the average between, 20, or between 2000 and 2050. And I guess I wanted to bring this up because we keep hearing, hey, you know, it's gonna, we're gonna have a drought with, with, um, with all the CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere. And we'll come back to this again later, but it's not entirely sure that we're going to have a drought locally. Some areas are gonna get drier, everywhere's probably gonna get warmer. But you can see even over the last hundred years, we've had CO2 levels rise and we don't see a great big change in our long-term precipitation, which is good news for us. It's another reason that Ventura County is a great place to live. Murray might talk more about river flows. These are recorded river flows in the Santa Clara River from 1956 through 2016. And you can see that the important thing here is the average, here I have 208,000. This is a couple of years old. It might be slightly different now, slightly higher. Um, and the median though, so the average, you just take all the numbers, you add them up and you divide by the number of years. And it really, the average gets skewed upwards by these great big boomer rainfall years. But really we have a lot of dry years. And so the median, which means half the years we have more rainfall than the median and half the years we have less rainfall than the median, that's only 117,000 acre feet. So really about half the time we have flows in the Santa Clara River, at least compared to this period, about 117,000 acre feet. Does that sound about consistent with what we are today? So only 17 out of the last 61 years where we have the good records, only 17 of those years had flows between the median and average. So that's only 28%. It suggests to me that we really don't have very many average years of flow in the Santa Clara River. We don't really have that many average years of rainfall either. They're either dry or they're wet. But water that we store during these big flow years really helps us get through the low flow years. So it's really important. And how did we get through those years? When we figured out how to drill wells and pump groundwater out of the ground. So 1920, our area, this is the farmland reported in about 1920. It's mostly along the river, the Ventura area. Oxnard Plain didn't have a lot of farming going on. And by 1949, pretty much the entire Oxnard Plain as it is today was irrigated agriculture and cranking out the food. So, so good for Los Angeles, good for our community. And that's all because people discovered about this great big, or they discovered this great big reservoir of water under our feet, especially the Oxnard Aquifer. So generally very good news. Uh, we're able to supply food to people during droughts. Uh, we've probably supplied food, you know, when I was a kid, we always heard about famines in Ethiopia and elsewhere, sending food, uh, ships full of food out there. Probably some came from Oxnard, some came from the Midwest, and it's because we were tapping our aquifers. It was a good thing for all those people that were uh, starving in other parts of the world. And I'm just coming back to this map real quick to show where our groundwater wells are. I'm not going to dwell on it, but you can see this is where our active the region's active groundwater supply wells are over the last few years. They're in the basin areas. And that will become relevant in a minute. I'll show you why. I just want to talk about what groundwater elevations do in those basins over time. How often are they full? Well, you can see that up in Piru, they're full most of the time. You can see the big droughts like the 1945 to 1965 drought we saw. Groundwater elevations dropped a lot. And then during more recent droughts in 1985 and then our most recent one, they drop, but they rise very quickly. And right now we're, we're back to pretty much having a full Piru Basin. Same is true in Fillmore Basin. Most of the time the, the basin is full of groundwater, which is a great thing. They just drop during droughts and then they pretty quickly recover. In the Oxnard Basin, that story isn't exactly the same. There we go, we got that stuff moved out of the top. The Oxnard Basin, uh, they tend to, uh, groundwater elevations were below what they should be. They should be up around 60 feet in the upper aquifer system. Um, but during that 1945 to 65 drought that I just told you was so bad, they dropped and it took a long time to recover into the 90s. And then they've dropped again. And here we are today, we still have, we're going to need a few more wet years before we can get back to, to having the Oxnard, the upper aquifer system in the Oxnard Basin back to where it should be. And this is the lower aquifer system out in Pleasant Valley, but it looks the same as the Oxnard Basin. 
And groundwater elevations started dropping in 1945 and they never have recovered. And in fact, they're below sea level. This is sea level at zero. So they've been below, groundwater elevations have been below zero in the lower aquifer system in Oxnard Plain and Pleasant Valley Basin for seven decades now. And that allows seawater intrusion to come in. And why are they below that level? Why are they below zero? Orange lines here show our groundwater extractions in the region over time. You can see this is when we discovered wells and pumping in the 1920s, they really kicked in. We kind of peaked on our groundwater extractions by the 1960s, maybe even the 1950s. And we had to add more water. We, I mean, I mean the region, United certainly contributed with surface water deliveries adding to the batch in blue. So we've been able to supply more water. State water project imports by Oxnard, us, uh, Camarillo, that really added a lot of water to mostly to the cities, and then Conejo Creek diversions recently. So the demand for water has increased a lot over time, and that's what's really hit the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley basins hard. And as a result, now with groundwater elevations below sea level, what that means is the direction of groundwater flow from the ocean has reversed, and now it's coming inland towards the wells. It has been for, for decades now, especially in the lower aquifer system. And we've been trying to keep up. We've done... <laughs> We've done amazing work over the decades, and we still are. This is going to be a banner year for us, but it hasn't been enough to quite help the lower aquifer system, which is why we need some more projects. Back in 1979, the State Water Research Control Board said, hey, if you keep doing what you're doing, we're going to have seawater intruded all the way to the 101 freeway up by, Pleasant, by Camarillo by the year 2000. And, and we thought, okay, that's a little ridiculous, but we all redoubled our efforts, us especially in the county and some other folks, and try to save the day. And so we managed to avoid that very ugly future of having basically the entire Oxnard Plain uh, filled with uh, Oxnard Basin and Pleasant Valley Basin filled with seawater. So this is the seawater intrusion limit as uh, in the upper aquifer system as of 1963 or the estimated where they thought seawater intrusion was. Remember, they thought this was just going to keep going and going all the way up to the freeway here in the north, up at Camarillo and El Rio, northern part of Oxnard. Instead, thanks to some of our projects, our conjunctive use projects and our increased recharge, we managed to hold it at bay. So this is seven, you know, 10, 15 years later where they estimated seawater intrusion. And other than this little lobe here, it doesn't really look that different. And 20 years after that, seawater intrusion, Again, there's a lobe here, but for the most part, it really hasn't advanced thanks to our efforts and the uh, efforts of other folks. And then this is 2016, a fairly recent estimate of seawater intrusion. And um, it looks like we're holding it at bay with our, with our projects and with our work. And that's the upper aquifer system. The lower aquifer system, we don't have much record prior to 1995, 1999, um, but it looks like we're doing a fairly good job of holding it at bay. It turns out that maybe a lot of um, the last few years, maybe there's been more seawater intrusion getting into the lower aquifer system, which is absolutely why we need some of our new project. We have to stop that. So this orange shows our pumping. I'm almost done here. Um, orange shows our pumping over the decades. You can see again, it mostly flattened out except for the 1980s and the green bars, oops, sorry. The green bars show our recharge um, and our diversions over time. And what's really impressive here you know, 30s and 40s, well, we had World War II in the 1940s and some floods that prevented us from really doing our thing as well as we could have way back then. We got smarter, we got better, and we, we got more support, and we were able to really kick up our recharge and our diversion operations into the 1990s. In fact, we almost caught up with pumping in the 1990s. That was a super wet year or super wet decade. Maybe we're heading for another one now. And... I think that's really what caused seawater intrusion to really get held at bay, despite everybody's expectation that the entire Oxnard Plain was going to be inundated with seawater by the year 2000. Now, this graph was made a couple of years ago, and this is supposed to be the 2010s. Well, it probably hasn't changed. The 2010s were a miserable year for recharge. It was just a terrible drought. There's no doubt about it. And people's demands kept going. But this year, maybe the start of uh, a new era of another really wet year. We'll see. And I'm almost at my last slide here. I just want to uh, mention what holds, what the future holds, the next hundred years. And so from California's fourth climate change assessment back in 2018, we're expecting another climate change assessment here in a couple of years. So maybe the, maybe the story will change a little bit, but current science mentioned kind of like I did with my earlier graph, 
that there is no statistically significant increasing or decreasing trend in historical precipitation and in a majority of the projections of precipitation. That's in our region. I'm not saying that's worldwide. Certainly some parts of the world are gonna get wetter, some are gonna get drier. It, you know, it's, it's a troubling uh, projection for the future. But in Ventura County, in our region, things look not that bad. And then on average, the precipitation, the projected precipitation changes are small compared to the historical variability, which means if we just keep planning for variability, in fact, if we get better at it, like we're planning to with some of our projects, We'll, we'll be well prepared for a future with, with climate change or without. However things go for us, I think we'll be better prepared um, as we understand um, how, we can, how we can keep the aquifers full, wet and dry. Now they do mention that droughts are supposed to be getting increasingly extreme in the 21st century. I, um, Pat um, O'Connell, one of our new um, senior hydrogeologists, he's looking at the downscale climate models specifically for Ventura County, Southern Ventura County. And it's hard to see that there's really much change in the future in our area. Other areas, yeah, it can be bad. But in our area, maybe, maybe we aren't going to get extremely or increasingly extreme droughts. It's hard to say. It's better to be prepared than not prepared. But I, I think this is going to be a great place to live uh, for the next 50 or 100 years for your grandparents or grandkids to, to be raised. And so this is from that same climate assessment. This is showing what rainfall is supposed to do over the next hundred years. This is under the, I think the RCP uh, 4.5 scenario. Yeah, I think it is. Um, so we're up here, let's see if I can get my other cursor. We're in the very end of the darker blue where it says 6.4. They're actually forecasting 6.4% more rainfall in our area, but we're right on the boundary of the 1.1. Either way, the forecast is for the next hundred years or 70 years to have a little more rainfall than we've had historically, not every year. <laughs> But over the long run. And then I think this is RCP 8.5 here. Oh no, this is late 20th, 21st century, sorry. And we're still in that same ballpark, you know, either no change in average precip or a little more average precip. Overall though, if we can do our part, we can survive and thrive through whatever nature has coming at us in the next 50 to 100 years. And then uh, this is just a downscaled model showing Ventura County. And the point of this, it's really hard to read. I won't spend any time on it, is that there's really not projected to be much change in rainfall here in Ventura County. And that was where I wanted to leave it so that Murray could talk about details of history. Did anybody have any questions? If I may, if we have time for questions. I'll let you go first. <laughs> 